Good morning, everybody. Brian Newbert here from GoldenBlack.com, live in Little Caesars Arena here in Detroit following Purdue's 80-68 to NCAA Tournament Sweet 16 win over Gonzaga, Gonzaga, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, this is your GoldenBlack.com rap video. It is brought to you by our friends at the Purdue Club Hotel. Still, apparently, no Detroit location. Uh, if there was, that's where I'd be staying tonight. Um, alas, there is not. If they want to put one in Windsor, I could have gone over there as well, but uh, no pretty new club hotel here in Detroit. Um, so uh, I will be going back to my other Marriott property uh, tonight, the Fairfield Inn. Um, you don't want to hear about hotels. You want to hear about basketball. Um, so Purdue beats Gonzaga, Gonzaga, however you want to pronounce it. And whatever nickname you want to call them, I'm not sure people generally know Gonzaga is the Bulldogs. Uh, everybody says Zags. Anyway, Gonzaga, Gonzaga, the Bulldogs, the Zags, whatever you want to call them, uh, are now 0-3 against Purdue in the last 18 months or so. This win for Purdue, putting them obviously 40 minutes away from their first Final Four since 1980, uh, the most significant albatross uh, Purdue's program and Matt Painter uh, still has flying overhead. Uh, could be dashed here in a matter of days. It won't be easy. Tennessee's very good, obviously, as you know, based on the fact that those have been absolute wars uh, between Purdue and Tennessee here in recent years. Um, again, we're picking on the poor albatross. Somewhere years and years and years ago, some sort of seafaring colonial or whatever it might have been decided they were just going to sully the good name of the albatross, uh, that poor bird, and make that what becomes aligned with things that prevent you from being successful, things that hover over you and hold you back. Um, and I just don't understand it. I, I think the albatross has gotten a bad name here, but alas, the albatross over Purdue is its final four drought, um, and Purdue might be on the verge here of dashing that Albatross. I don't know if you can dash a bird, but whatever. Um, because of this excellent, excellent win over Gonzaga, um, led by uh, elite guard play uh, once again for Purdue, but also always good to have Zach Eady on your team. 27 and 14, ho hum, ho hum. You know, he finishes the first half on a flurry, uh, puts Purdue in the lead after it was kind of a possession to possession game in the first half. And then what happens inevitably, inevitably uh, I guess I call it the in inevitability of Purdue, there's kind of that grind factor. There's that battle of attrition. Um, I haven't quite coined the proper term yet, but when Purdue has them down four at half, when Graham Ike's already made two threes, uh, and they've had a pretty good half offensively, Purdue had them right where they wanted them. Uh, it's just that simple with Purdue because the toll they put on you, um, it's really, really hard to play 40 good minutes against this team. Maybe not 40 good minutes, 40 minutes better than Purdue. It, it's Nobody's done it yet. Purdue's lost games because of turnovers, but nobody has beaten Purdue's best yet this season. Uh, and when Purdue was up four at half, the game was, in my mind, the game was over uh, because Purdue was going to eventually – find that second gear, which happens to align with whatever toll uh, has been taken by the opponent uh, fading it. And that's you know sort of precisely what happened. Purdue shoots 61% after halftime. Trey Kaufman-Wren again gets them going early in the second half to get them started. Edie eventually takes over. Braden Smith just has his game on a string like he does every game this season seemingly. Um, Guards Lance Jones and Fletcher Lawyer were really, really good. I thought Fletcher Lawyer, you know, for a guy who takes seven shots in a game, played about as well as you could. Uh, I think he's really been quietly very, very, very good this season. Sometimes not quietly, uh, sometimes overtly, sometimes very, very loud. Um, but in games where he's not sort of the featured guy or whatever, he and Trey Kaufman ran alike in situations where Purdue needs them needs them to really deliver for them in certain situations against certain matchups, whatever it might be, those guys have been pretty good about delivering. You know, Kaufman Wren starting the second half, strong lawyer, making great decisions, making 
shots when necessary. Um, just a really good game from him, really good game from Kaufman Wren. Uh, even though the numbers there are only six points, they were six points in a row that started the run that got Purdue pulled away in this. So uh, a much more important player for Purdue today than the, the statistics would indicate, uh, as was Fletcher Lawyer, but obviously Braden Smith, 15 assists. I've, I've said here before uh, that, you know, I, I've been doing this quite a while, um, and I can't even think of more than a couple of 10 assist games that I covered over the years prior to Braden Smith, and now it's like every game. Um, 15 assists to two turnovers um, is just remarkable. Uh, not something you see very often in college basketball, um, but also he gets eight rebounds and 14 points. He's going to get one of those triple doubles one of these days. It would have been wild for him to get it in the NCAA tournament here today, uh, but he came those two rebounds short. Uh, I don't know how many times he's flirted with a triple-double, but it, it's probably a half dozen times now this season. Um, you know, Purdue wins this game shooting only 10 free throws. Uh, that's not typically its formula, um, but it's proof once again that, you know, Purdue can beat you a lot of ways. Uh, they can beat you in the half court. They can beat you with threes. They can beat you with Zach Eady. Uh, they can beat you with any combination thereof. They can beat you in the open floor. And I thought the first game, against Gonzaga in Honolulu, Purdue basically beat Gonzaga at its own game. It got out in the open floor a lot, really, really made that a fast-paced game, really laid a gauntlet for the rest of the season that says, hey, Purdue can beat you a lot of different ways. This game was you know, sort of one of those uh, half-court monster truck shows for Purdue with Zach Eady and in the second half, Trey Kaufman ran, uh, getting 33 points between them, mostly in the post. Um, just a really, really uh, diverse Purdue team in terms of the ways it can find offense. A good enough team defensively, as I think they uh, showed, especially in the second half of this game. Um, and just a team that's looking the part of a legitimate, I mean, not looking the part. They've been great all season. It, this isn't a new development. Purdue's been one of the best basketball teams in the college game all season long. And they are really looking like they are at the top of their game at the ideal time uh, right now, as opposed to last year, which isn't relevant anymore, uh, with the exception of the story of what that made this team. You know, in the NCAA tournament, we go in the locker room after games, and it's just wild. Uh, Sam King from the Drolling Career just pointed out a, a, a really, really interesting thing. He pulled out the photo uh, after Purdue in the Sweet 16 in 2019 the iconic photo that one of Purdue's photographers got of Carson Edwards screaming and having water dumped on him as he as he moved the Purdue, I don't know what to call it, placard? Is it placard? A uh, piece of cardboard with the word Purdue on it from one part of the bracket to the other uh, to advance it. He's screaming, everybody's celebrating. It's complete bedlam. That's right, bedlam. Um, after a win to move Purdue into the Elite Eight juxtapose that juxtapose that to this year when you got a bunch of guys just sitting in the locker room are they happy of course they're happy but they're not they're not patting each other on the back there's no self-congratulation you would if you didn't know any better you would think it's just arrogance or apathy one or the other but it, it's really just this quiet confidence that has kind of driven them all season long that legitimately they look at this like this is their quote-unquote destiny, that this is how it's supposed to go, that when Purdue plays its best basketball, this is what happens, and Purdue's standard is itself. It's not how it stacks up to opponents. It's, it's itself, and you just see the, this real purpose in this Purdue team, this real focus, this real drive that's very uncommon, and honestly, you know, in, in the context of all the NCAA tournament locker rooms I've been in, kind of eerie. Uh, it is kind of weird, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, because it's just, it just belies so much the highs and lows, the emotional peaks and valleys of the NCAA tournament. Because every game somebody loses here, their season's over. At minimum, the winning team normally exudes some kind of relief, some kind of emotion, period. I'm not saying Purdue doesn't exude any of that, 
but it's just very businesslike. That's the best word I can come up with. Businesslike, um, just laser focused, and just absolutely, ultimately confident. I think that has come out all season long, and that is really pretty remarkable given some of the events that you know Purdue's been on the wrong end of uh, in the last. 18 months or so, whatever time frame you want you want to uh, you want to apply here. Um, what happened a year ago at this time is something that could have really scarred this team, and could have applied ultimate pressure to this team. They seem completely immune to any sort of pressure. You know, everybody would say that, but sometimes your words are belied I keep using that word today belied by what people see in you and what we see from Purdue what I see from Purdue I can't speak for you guys what I see from Purdue aligns 100% I keep using that word too aligns 100% with what they say nothing seems to shake these guys Uh, nothing seems to weigh on these guys that is really, really um, pretty interesting, pretty re- pretty remarkable, to be honest with you. It just, these are young people playing a, a pressurized game, and that is a pretty, pretty hard thing to do, is to not feel the pressure in an environment like this. At any time, your season could end, in like Zach Eady's case, Mason Gillis's case, Ethan Morton's case, Lance Jones' case, your career is over. Um, or at least the Purdue portion of your career is over. Um, you just don't see any of it. You don't see any of the normal dynamics of the NCAA tournament, which is the highest stakes, most zero-sum environment a college basketball player can be in. It's really, really this unique uh, sort of dynamic around this team that I've never seen anything like it, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, it really bodes well for Purdue moving forward. It really, really gives the look of a team that has a really higher purpose here that believes in itself ultimately um, almost like this is all preordained it's not obviously Purdue's got to go out and earn this but it just looks like Purdue is just laying waste to people here um, because they've come into the sense of like tournament like a Terminator like the opening scene in Terminator 2 where the the Terminator 2 without skin steps on the skulls and kind of looks at the camera with the, the red eyes this is getting a little uh, off the rails here. Um, so Purdue's got Tennessee on Sunday uh, for a trip to the Final Four. The story tomorrow will be a couple of coaches who've never been to the Final Four uh, in Rick Barnes and Matt Painter. Uh, I'm not a big must-win guy. Uh, I've never really applied that term to a lot of things. But at this point, with this Purdue team getting this close right now, you kind of got to have this one, don't you? Uh, this one can't end the way the Virginia game ended a couple years ago. Nothing could ever top that in terms of disappointment. But you got to think, you know, this is the most golden of opportunities uh, for Purdue, and it would be uh, really, really unfortunate to for it to slip away at this point. Um, that's not to say Tennessee won't play their asses off against Purdue. They know Purdue. Um, it's going to be a hell of a game. I keep saying over and over again, there's going to be close games. There's going to be scares. At some point, luck is going to have to come in into play in Purdue's favor for them to do this. And I keep being wrong because Purdue's played three NCAA tournament games, and they have smashed all of them, all of those opponents. Now, this was only a 12-point game, but the second half was, um, you know, after that early run by Purdue, I'm not sure that, You could look at that game and say, I think Gonzaga is still going to come back and get this. That just wasn't the reality of it. Uh, Purdue is winning and looking really good doing it and looking like a team that is, you know, steamrolling to places it hasn't been in a very long time. That said, I could be completely wrong. Purdue could turn the ball over 20 times on Sunday, lose, and my, my mentions on Twitter will go unread for the rest of my life. Um... So that's kind of what I got from Purdue's 80 to 68 Sweet 16 win over Gonzaga, putting Purdue in a position, a very, very attractive position to be in here. Uh, we'll have a lot to talk about here in the next couple days. 
So I'm not going to ramble on and on and on until I actually say that, and then I do ramble on and on and on. Um, so from Little Caesars Arena, uh, I've always had a problem with Little Caesars, and I'm going to voice it right now. So the name of the company is Little Caesars, right? But it's not an apostrophe S, so it's not a singular Little Caesar who takes possession of this business, who has possession of this business. It's multiple Little Caesars because the punctuation indicates that Little Caesars without a possessive apostrophe is multiple Little Caesars. It just bothers me. It's always bothered me. It's never sat right with me how they do that. Um, so th this collective of little miniature Caesars owns this pizza company instead of one larger little Caesar, which I guess is like jumbo shrimp. That's the ultimate, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Contradiction. Um, anyway, from Little Caesars Arena, um, this is Brian Newbert from goldenblack.com. Thank you for watching, thank you for reading, thank you for listening, and thank you for processing our materials, however it is you process our materials. And thank you to the Premium Club Hotel once again for your support. Uh, we appreciate it as always, and I will talk to you guys again Sunday night here from Little Caesars Arena, where all the bread is crazy. Thanks, everyone.